Welcome to our preview of day three of the 2024 Cheltenham Festival. Emmett Kennedy alongside the superb Katie Young, who is live from Cheltenham, and six-time champion tipster Paul Jacobs, the man who is going to mark our card. He crushed it on day three of Cheltenham last year on the Final Furlong podcast. So, of course, we had to get him back for day three of Cheltenham 2024. We're going to dive straight in to the first race, the Turner's Novice Chase. The betting is headed by two British horses, and they may very well fight at the finish, just like they did at Cheltenham earlier in the season. Ginny's Destiny, 100 to 30. Grey Dawning now favourite, 5 to 2 for Harry and Dan Skelton. And Fasal Vega confirmed for this race, stepping up and trip for the first time, and he is being supported 9 to 2, 7 to 2, now around about a 3 to 1 shot. Paul Jacobs, let's get your thoughts on who's going to win the Turner's. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, wherever you are around the world. And as uh, Mr. Dursley said in one of the Harry Potter films, what's the best day of the week? And he said it was Sunday because there was no post. The best day of the week at Cheltenham is Thursday. It's just a great rip, isn't it, of, of graded races and the best handicaps on the card. And if I had one day to choose, it would be today. You talk about the, t- I think it's a fascinating opening race, the Turners. What's the ground going to be like? New course, fresh ground. What's the punting angles? You know, if I was to ask one person, yeah, for advice on today, it probably would have been the late, great Dave Allen, who died on this day last year, 2005. And his his greatest quote was, just ask the minister for the truth. He may not tell you, but he sure the hell knows it. And so if you ask a trainer what the truth is, he knows it, but he may not tell you. For me, Ginny's Destiny has the best form of the book. And he's got it around Cheltenham, and that, that, that's massive for me. Um, and that's a pretty daunting profile to bring into a race of this nature. And there's a possibility here, guys. He could have his own way up front, which is a, another plus. Facil Vega is fascinating. To my eyes, he, he's always looked sort of, kind of a tad short of pace over two miles. And I don't know what you two think, but I think it's a surprise that really hasn't tried him over further before now. Um, he surely went too quickly early on in the grade one of the Dublin Festival. And to my eyes, that was jockey error, but the, the horse wasn't right, right. We found out since then. So you can give Paul a pass over that one. But he is uh, unexposed over this trip. We, we simply don't know. I don't know. I could venture forth uh, some kind of a reasoning. But if you're looking outside those two, and I, I don't like Grey Dorney because I think he's bottomless stamina. And the times he's tried over two and a half miles, they've gone a tad too quick for him. His jumping has has slightly suffered. I prefer to see him in the Brown Advisory. I think he's all about stamina. And I like a really big outsider here. I mean, we're talking 40, uh, 50 to one here. Colonel Harry's one blip came on good ground in the Silly Isles at Sandown, um, where they went to stride too quick on that ground early on. And he was kind of taken out of his comfort zone. Plus, he jumped right-handed. He definitely wants to go this way around. For me, he's the forgotten horse of the race. He's a ridiculous price if you take away that last run. I have him £7 on my ratings behind Ginny's Destiny. Um, But here's the other rub for you guys. Uh, We all know they're not machines racehorses. Uh, How many times do you forgive a bad run? One, possibly two, yeah. Three, maybe not. I'm happy to forgive that last run in the Silly Owls at Sandown. I think Ginny's Destiny is the most likely winner. But VFM, we talk about all the time, value for money. I thought Colonel Harry was a big outsider with a chance of a place at the very least. I knew you were going to come in with some big opinions. I was not expecting a 40 to 1 shot in the very first race, though. Paul Jacobs laying it down. Katie, who do you like in the opening race? I've been keen on Fasal Vega now, um, stepping up and trip. I, I thought he was crying out for a trip, kind of watching his last two runs. And I'm hoping the two mile four will really bring out that little bit of improvement. I think he's jumping. He looks as though he's just a little bit too slow and outpaced over over the two mile trip. And I think the two and a half will just, he'll bring him back much more into his comfort zone. Um it is going into the unknown, but sometimes that that first time over a new trip, we do see them at the best. So I'd be love, I'd be willing to take a chance on him. I think he's the classiest horse in the race by far. Um, I don't think Grey Dornan is the worthy favourite of this. His highest um, RPR he's recorded this year was one six two, and that was over three mile. 
um, at Warwick on his latest start. So coming back to two and a half now, to me, wouldn't wouldn't be a little bit of a red flag, maybe. Um, Ginny's destiny, I think he, he should probably be a little bit short from the betting. He's got the track, course and distance for more than one. And he's got an RPR of 162 for his efforts um, around Cheltenham. So on that, I think he should probably be the favourite um, coming into this. But I just can't take my mind away from Fasel Vega. I think he's just way above these. Um, and I'd be willing for him. I think the connection seemed very excited about him stepping up and trip as well. So that's something to note. Um, Iraco, I there's an awful lot of buzz around this horse, but I just like he was brilliant on his course debut. But like, how can you how can you be taking a chance on him at five to one? And he's ran once over fences at the beginning of the season back in November, like so much can change between November and this and kind of between now and Cheltenham, you know, like we see so many horses running out impressive winners at the start of the season and they, they come to Cheltenham and then like look at um, Vivori de Champdu, for example, he was very impressive at the start of the season. What, what's he done since, do you know? And I just think it's a little bit of a chance to take with him. I do think he's a very good horse, but, it's a lot to ask coming to Cheltenham off the back of one run and not an ideal prep either. So I'd be a bit wary of him, but I do think he has an abundance of ability, but maybe just come up in a little bit too short with him. In the last 10 runnings, no horse has won this race having not already won at the trip. The only one who did was dropping down in distance, which makes things all the more intriguing about Fasal Vega because I think he'll go off favourite. If Mullins is having the Cheltenham we all think he's having, the money's going to fly in for this fella. Appreciated went off an 11-8 to favourite for this race last year, having been beaten in the Irish Arkle. And maybe this guy will go the same way. I think he's a different kettle of fish to Appreciated, though. He's a champion bumper winner. Obviously, Appreciated won the Supreme, um, placed in a champion bumper. It's the other way around for Fasal Vega. But he clearly is going to be better going up in distance. I was amazed Danny Mullins was saying on the final furlong last week, he would love to ride him in the Arkle if Paul chose Ilete Tom and that he would have ridden him really? with confidence. Yeah. Yeah. That, wow. That actually confuses me, Paul. Because I, I can't tell me if too. that's a really good thing that, oh, you think he's so good he could actually still win the Arkle. Or does that mean that they're a little bit nervous about him going up and trip? He's bred for it. He should stay, Paul. And talking about the Brown Advisory, we've only got six in the Brown Advisory. You can bet your bottom dollar that Harry Cobden is going to try and test factor file stamina right down to the bottom of the pan. That's obviously another day, and we're talking about Thursday. But I think you're right. Wrong race. Yeah. Uh, it hurts my bank balance, quite frankly, because we had him <laughs> at such a big price. No! It's almost like oh, Frank Berry right. was doing it to spices. <laughs> oh dear dearie me as if he cares what some bloke on a podcast is saying i'm with katie he has to defy the stats but he's a cheltenham horse it's going to happen for fasal vega i was told that, that willie mullins is working fasal vega harder than he's ever worked him before now is that a good thing or is that something to be a little bit nervous about i wouldn't be too much of a worry now i mean i think it every horse is different and he might just be training more individually on what would suit him and if he thinks training him harder is the right thing to do with him and so we all know William Mullins he's a genius anyway but if he thinks that's the way to train him and he thinks he's going to eke out a bit more improvement then he's probably right but a lot of these horses on the gallop see if they're you know it's harder to get them fit the better ones because they find it so easy so maybe he's just trying to stick his gun his head to the guns now and just get that little bit more of improvement out of him at home just to to then transfer it to the track. I'm with you, and I'm with Fasal Vega. I think he'll win. I can't talk about Jello all season and then not mention him for this race. I think at a big price, he's really interesting, but Colonel Harry's a much, much bigger price and possibly a much more interesting angle into this, but Fasal Vega for Katie and I. Uh, to the pretemps, where Chantry House and Cletus Pula head the betting, along with... Gwaith Qual? Yeah, there we go. I've... I've miserable at Irish. I'm supposed to be the Irish person who can say this. I don't have a bloody clue. Um, they're in and around those three 
<laughs> Paul, do you want to try that pronunciation of Ted Walsh's horse? I listen. I may be a born and bred scouser, and that's quite close to Ireland, but I'm, I'm not doing it. Okay, I'm just not doing it. Casey. Um. I don't. I don't. Guy cool. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Welcome back to Pronunciation Corner on the Final Furlong Podcast. Oh. <laughs> Number 17. The Ted Walsh horse. The Ted Walsh horse. Jeez. Uh, okay, Iker LN hasn't run in the calendar year and only one horse this century has won the pretemps having not had a run in the calendar year, but he eh, got him qualified and just put him away, I suspect. <laughs> uh, these are the four who had the betting. Katie Young, who do you think is going to win the pretemps? There's not really kind of standing out to me, you know, for the first time uh, looking at this. I'd say number 17 now probably hasn't done much wrong this season and um, probably has the, the experience down uh, for this race. A big handicap horse, runs well in, the, in over the trip. Um, those big handicaps travels powerfully through the race. I'd be keen enough on her now. Ted Walsh. Do you know, he had any second now primed ready for um, Cheltenham a few years ago. And I, he's a very, very good trainer. And I, he speaks volumes about this horse. And I'd be willing to take a chance on her, on her for sure. I've liked what she's done um, over in Ireland and have been following her closely. She's a lovely weight, 10-10. Um, um, so, yeah, I'd be taking a chance on her. Chantry House, they seem to be saying the cheek pieces are setting this horse alight. So it'd be interesting to see um what he does on the track with those on um eight to one probably he probably is the classiest horse in the in the race going forward but i just i'm not sure now with him i just i think a kind of a, a younger horse like guys cool might just suit this race better so i'm gonna go with ted walsh's horse guys cool if that's how you say it I, I, i'm not questioning you at all ted walsh's horse paul jacobs who do you like in the pretense uh well Rain, rain, and more rain again. Uh, and I was been waiting for the weather to break for the top weight for Oud de Lain, who I think is very interesting off a mark of 154. Uh, and if young Carl Miller, who's looked a really neat jockey, uh, had thrown the kitchen sink at him, I think he would have won his qualifier at Leopardstown. But <laughs> there was no need to do so. Why go and win your qualifier? Um, I think he would have beaten Lon Press as he stood up in last year's Brown Advisory. And his best performance as a novice hurdler was when he beat Vanillier in the Lions of Limerick. And what was, you remember that day, was desperate ground. It was horrible ground. A mark of 154, Les Miller's claim, he's interesting. A Carol Ann has been the talking horse since, as you said, Emmett, since last November. But I still question three miles for him, especially on the new course on deep ground. Now, you did a brilliant interview with, with the nicest man in horse racing, per se. In fact, probably one of the nicest men in the world without horse racing tagged to him, Henry de Bromhead. It, it was a sensational interview. What a gentleman he is. Um, and he's got the well back Gabby's Cross. Uh, and this gelding has unfinished business over hurdles. He's two from nine. He's unexposed at the trip over Timber, although his mark of 133 is it's hardly a gimme. But I think he possibly, Henry, has a better chance with Popova, who was four and a quarter lengths behind a stable mate in that Punchers Town qualifier and was given, and you guys will appreciate this, shall we say, um, a cautious ride by Rachel finishing full of running. Um, pounds for lengths for me uh, matter little when, when you're assessing the weights here, as it's all about qualifying and securing a final place in the field. Uh, daughter of rule of the world, she's got unknown stamina, only a second start over three miles off one three two. There could be loads more to come from Popova over her stable moat Gabby's Cross with a saver on Farouk the land at a fair price. But Popova massively interests me. I thought that was an eye catcher beyond eye catchers in the qualifier. I would agree with you. Um, I think both of Henry's horses, Gabby's Cross, but also uh, your horse are, are really intriguing. I find this difficult to get away from Cletus Pula. Um, I think the opportunity to back the Ballyburn form line at a fair price is, is an intriguing one. Gordon's won this with young horses before, including a five-year-old for Gigginstown. And 
he was doing all his best work at the finish the other day at Nace. Like he's in the four, so he's already qualified, but he was still staying on really strongly behind Noble Birth. He was sent off favourite for that race. I think he's interesting, and I suspect he's better than one three nine. So at eight to one, I'm going to side with uh, with Cletus Pula, but it's not a strong opinion. Although if he wins, I'll be shouting and roaring about how we put him up on the final round. <laughs> of course you will. Go, Emmett. <laughs> Isn't that how this works? Uh, Ryanair Chase. It is. This is this is becoming very frustrating, I suspect, for the O'Brien team because there's it's highly unlikely Banbridge will run. And if he did, he would be very compromised in this race. Paul Jacobs, who's going to win the Ryanair Chase? You were all over Envoy LN at 14 to 1 in this race last year. Tell us who's going to win it this year. <laughs> Well, you, you know, Emma, this has the potential to be a real blowout up front with Protectorat, Miller's Bank, possibly a Hoy Senor, uh, possibly the Presser Hitman, and of course, Stage Star. And we've just mentioned five there. Um, so getting the fractions right for Harry Skelton and co is going to be the key here. Um, and on forecast, uh, fresh ground, probably a bit of rain on Thursday morning. They're, st- they're going to go a pace here. So to my eyes, the probability of a rapid run race uh, brings to the game holder horses that possibly have a bit to find on the ratings, yeah, to land a gold medal. But the makeup of the race, the makeup of the race suggests that closes that ratings gap between those that are going to be at the front of affairs and are the highest rated and those that are maybe seven to ten pound low in the ratings. And the, the two horses that come to mind are GA Law and Fugitive. Um, the last name found the two miles of the Clarence House, just a little bit too sharp last time out. He looks set to outrun his price. We've got to mention Envoy Alain, who has the adva- he has a great advantage over all of those horses and that he can be put anywhere in the race. I mean he's really flexible, isn't he? Tactical wise. Um I think he looked a bit short of pace over two and a half miles in the uh, PWC champion chase and was better served in a slower and race over three miles where he pipped Jerry Colomb in the champion chase at Down Royal. Um, is he past his best? Well, there's no reason to suggest he is based on the evidence of this season. Um, but a fast run race over this trip, and we're going to get it, suits him fine. Um, I'd rather have an each way play on GA Law than have a win bet on anything else. But I'm not going to have a big a big bet here, Emmett. I think this is a race I'm going to just sit back and watch and enjoy because I think there are better wages on the rest of the card. I find this really difficult to get away from Envoy Alain. And the more I listen back to that Henry de Bromhead interview, he just sounded to be in really... He sounded to be really pleased with them. Um, missing races this season was initially something that was worrying me. But look at his record. He's raced off a break of 60 days or more eight times and won six of them, including this race last year. He fell on this day a couple of years ago. He's been third in a champion chase, and he's won a champion bumper, a bearing Bingham, and this race. I think he's going to win. He's just better than all of these. I think he'd have beaten Alaho and Voilen for me. Katie Young, who are you with? So I was quite keen on Bambridge. Um... I think the ground might have just gone a little bit too soft for him now, which is disappointing because I was really keen on him, um, especially after he ran out a really impressive winner at Kempton against Pick Dorian, and he's since gone and won. So that really backs up his form. But I just think he wants nice ground. I'm not sure that, that he's going to get that here. It might just be a little bit too soft for him, so I am a bit hesitant with him. Um there's two horses that I like. Um, Capodanno is one. I was really keen on him when he won the Cotswolds Chase uh, at the end of January um, at big price. Um, he seemed to really enjoy the new track. Um, I know he is dropping back down to two and a half, which might be a little bit of a worry. Um, I do think he probably is a three mile chaser at best, but I think they're going to go a hard gallop and sitting at the back playing a patient game with him like Paul did in the Cotswold Chase when he won I think that'll suit him down to the ground and I think because they'll go a good gallop in this the two mile fall won't be as such an issue because it probably will be more of a stamina test coming into this um, so I'm quite keen on him at 8-1 to one. I think he's a nice price um, he's coming in 
off the back of a, a win again, and I think he's probably improving as the season goes on. I, another horse I really like is Fildor. I think he's two really impressive runs this season behind Dino Blue and El Fabiolo. Like he was within four and a half lengths of El Fabiolo. Like that's not like on over a trip that probably isn't his optimum trip. He's crying out for two and a half to me anyway. He was in Gordon's when I was there and he always looked like he was going to be a two and a half to three miler. I think the ground will suit him. The trip will suit him. He's easy to, he's easy to ride, you know, whatever pace the race, if they go fast, if they go slow, like he's a consistent horse. I think 12 to one, he might be a little bit of value coming into this. He's coming in under the radar because he hasn't won this season. I think he's very, very good horse. I think the track will suit him, the ground will suit him, and the way the race will run will suit him as well. And for a bit of value, I think you want to be looking at him. Ooh, I like it. Uh, Phil Dorr is currently available at 12 to 1, but he is being cut by a number of firms to 10s. Um, one has even gone 9 to 1. So by the time this podcast comes out, maybe the gamble will be in full effect. And Rob Corr paid a whole lot of money to keep him at Gordon Elliott's yard. Rob Corr have got a very strong hand for the Paddy Power Stairs hurdle. They have the favourite, Tihupu, who is 2 to 1, best price. Uh, Irish Point, we know, is going to go for the champion hurdle. Crambo for Fergal O'Brien, who was on the show a couple of weeks ago, sounded very bullish. Johnny Burke in the, in the place, a 5-1 to one shot. Noble Yates, winner of a recognised trial of this. And Harry Cobden will ride for Emmett Mullins. The Grand National winner is a 9-1 to one shot. So Gerard, a fascinating runner for Willie Mullins and Paul Townend, 10-1. to one. And a former dual winner of this race, Flooring Porter, a 12-1 to one shot. Katie Young, who wins the 2024 Stairs Hurdle? I love Tia Poo. I looked after Tia Poo for years when I was in Gordon's. He was my number one. Bush, I just cannot have him in the springtime. I just don't think he's a spring horse. Um, to me, he's a heavy, Irish heavy ground horse. I, I don't think he's going to get the ground he wants in Sheldon. I know there's going to be soft in the description, but I just don't think it's going to be soft enough for him. If you look back through his form, like I think he's not from five between March and May. I just cannot. I I know I love him. I love the horse bits, but I I just I just don't think he's as fe as effective in the springtime as he is in the winter. I was actually gutted that Gordon didn't run him through the winter. And I couldn't get my head around it because he is at his best probably between October to February, and he's running once, and I I just couldn't get my head around it because he's a horse. He's a mud lover. That's when he runs his best races is in the deep winter ground. And I really fancied him that year for Champion Hurdle. And he just did not, he didn't even turn up on that ground. And he came over in really good nick, but he just never even raised a gallop. And that is a worry for me. I know people are saying that he should have won it last year, whatever about the ride. I just, I don't know whether he's a spring horse and I have my doubts about, the, about that with him. So put my cards on the table here and saying I I could see him getting beaten, Jersey. Even though he is the best horse in the race. I am falling into a depression here. Because I've been <laughs> so bullish about this horse all along and Katie comes straight away. Just like actually, here's why he cannot win, you moron. Oh no, Katie. Oh no. There's logic to what you're saying. He is coming into this race fresh, which he hasn't done at Cheltenham before. He's raced four times off a break of 60 days or more and won all four. And I think it's seven times off a break of 50 days or more, and he's won all seven. Mm -hmm. So they've changed things a little bit. But if you're right about the ground, then... Oh, no. Yeah, I, I, that year I brought him to Cheltenham and we thought he was in really good nick. And... Oh. He didn't even, couldn't even lay up on good ground. I just had that in the back of my mind. And the fact, if you look through his form between March and May, like, I just don't think there's a case for him based on that. And that is the worry with me. But it he's is the, a very, very weak race. He's the two to one no, favorite, I, Katie. What are you doing? <laughs> but that's what I mean. It's a very, very weak division. So. He might get away with it, but I'd have my doubts. I'm sorry, I'd, I just have my doubts. No, hey, listen, I'd, I'd rather know now. Uh, I'm not deserting him, by the way. 
and, and I'll give my reasons why in a second. Who do you think is going to win? I, I think it, it, it's a maudlin race. Like, there's a case for everything. Like, Crambo, they're on about him. Noble Yates. Like, you could argue for him. Sir Gerard stepping up to three mile. Like, he's had a funny old season again. But he could pop up. We know he likes Cheltenham. He'll go on any ground. Um, Florent Porter's another odd season been redirected from a chase campaign would be a little bit red flag for me, but they obviously think this race was going to suit him best. Um, Paisley Park, another a 12-year-old, him and Sider Berlin, very similar profiles. The two of them always run, run solid races. Like Sider Burley is getting absolutely no credit at all for what he's done. He's won two ancient hurdles. He won Stays Hurdle last year and only just got beaten in the in the punch town Sayers hurdle as well. He was only being about a length. Like for a tw- for that one, he was eleven then. For an eleven year old, like that's unbelievable. And he's not even getting a mention in any of these podcasts. God love him. But I think if Cider Burley is in the form he was in last year, and if the race runs to suit him, if there's plenty of pace, he could run another side race here. And I don't think you can dismiss him at all. He has run twice off a break of 26 to 35 days. So it's 32 days he's been off the track. He's won on both occasions. He's won at three Cheltenham festivals. He's placed at Cheltenham on a further two occasions. And he's over 20 to 1 as the reigning champion. With the form holding up. (laughs) The form is holding up. Dashiell Drasher came out and won earlier this year. He was behind him. He went to Aintree, won the grade one, proved it wasn't a fluke. Started up early. Tihupu beats Imperia Pass at the start of the season, and nobody well, is mentioning him. He's the third highest rated horse in the race on time form, which actually means he's the second highest rated horse in the race because they still have Irish Point in there. And nobody wants to give him any credit. And it's funny Mad. because he's in he's in the green and gold JP's colours. You'd think he'd be going off much shorter than he than he than he is at the moment, but yeah, I I think he'd be you'd be mad to dismiss him. Um and I know he's only had one run this season, but we all know he loves Cheltenham. Um, and you okay. can't deny that. I, I got to fight for Tiapu's honour here. Um, come, I have to fight for Tiapu's honour against the girl who used to ride him out and look after him. <laughs> and minded him at Cheltenham. <laughs> when, he ran, when he was sent off 9-1 to one for the champion hurdle. Oh, dear. How am I going to spin this narrative, Paul Jacobs? Go on, Em. Do it. Go on, do it. The, the ground, hopefully, if you're right, the ground is going to be soft, although I'm worried about the fact that you're saying you think he's a proper Irish soft ground horse, which means he won't be getting his ideal mm-hmm. conditions. But you look back at last year's stairs hurdle. That's a terrible ride from Davy Russell. Do you look back on that stairs hurdle last year. It's, a, oh, it's an awful ride. Form is held up, though. Sarda Burley went on and won the grade one at Aintree. Dashiell Drasher's come out and won very well. Lizzie Kelly actually fancies Dashiell Drasher to run a big race again this year. And he just looks to be a physically mentally stronger horse this year. Iris's gift was beaten in the Sarah's hurdle in his first attempt as a six-year-old, came out and won the race a year later. Brave Inca, I've said this before, but Brave Inca beaten on his first attempt at the champion hurdle, wins it a year later. Native River and Aplutard, both beaten on their first tries at the Gold Cup, win it a year later. Defeat in a championship race at Cheltenham does not preclude you from winning that race again. And if he's able to replicate the performance of last year, he has to be better, and Sire de Burley couldn't possibly be as good. Therefore, he will win. And where is the danger coming from? Crambo? Maybe. Maybe. But with respect, he's been graduating from the handicap ranks. I don't know if that's going to be good enough to be able to win this. And the grade one form from the last day, I don't think holds up in the context of this race. I'd be a little bit nervous of home by the Lee. I could see this race panning out well for him, but I couldn't trust him. Flooring Porter, who knows which version of him is going to turn up. There is a horse in the race, though, that I would be very afraid of, and that's Sir Gerrard. I, I think this idea that Sir Garrett doesn't stay is a fallacy. We have no idea. He decked every single fence in the Brown Advisory last year. So wouldn't have mattered what distance he was running over. He was never staying. He was never winning that race, given how he was jumping. And he's basically a horse with no country. He's not quite fast enough for a champion hurdle. And he will kill himself if they keep running him over fences. He's a danger to himself and others. So perhaps he's ending up in a stairs hurdle because there's just nothing else for him. But I think that makes him dangerous. And he was very good over hurdles the last day. It's Willie Mullins and Paul Townend in a championship race at Cheltenham 
and you're getting 10 to 1 about a horse who was won at two Cheltenham festivals before, I would not be sleeping on him. I think he's a very, very dangerous contender. And he's run four times off a break of 60 days or more, and he's won on three occasions. I don't think stamina is an issue for him, and he'll be involved in the finish. But Tihupu, Katie, will win. Paul Jacobs, who wins the stairs hurdle? I think it's a bloody awful renewal. I think it's terrible. <laughs> There's more old men in this field than I have as friends down the local <laughs> Red Lion. It's terrible. I think if you haven't backed Tihu Poo and an anti-post price bigger than he is now, and it, you, you'd be a little bit uh, two to one. It's right on yeah. the cusp. Do you have any idea how dejected one feels when he's trying to make a point about a horse and the person who looked after the horse at a Cheltenham festival and knows him best is saying... Yeah, I don't know about this now. <laughs> it's like, oh no! <laughs> Katie, now, what have you done, Katie? What have you done to the man? In fairness now, like, when he got beat last year, I backed him straight away for the stairs because he was 8-1. to one. Yeah. So I jumped on because I knew he was going to be shorter again, but as a kind of cover bet. But I just don't... At 2-1, to one, I just think he's too short. Like, there's two... There's too many red flags, more than green flags with him, I think. And that's just, at that price, I just couldn't tell, be telling people to back him. Um, yeah. And as Paul said, there's just much more value if you look true side to Burley, like proven over any ground, side to Burley's three, three-time winner at Cheltenham Festival and runner-up twice. Like, Tia Poo has been there twice and hasn't won I just, I just proceed with caution with him. Like we talked about the race, it isn't a good renewal, and his class might just win him on the day. But look what he did in Punchtown at the end of last season. He was fourth behind um, Classical Dream, Side of Burley, and Assyrian for long. Like that was good ground again, and he couldn't, he couldn't even compete with them at that level. So I just would proceed with caution. Are we putting this up on YouTube? Or is this for the audio section, or is this going on YouTube? It is going on YouTube. Those of you who have been watching me will just see me in a torture chamber. <laughs> like my whole demeanor just went, oh no. I could be wrong, Emma. I could be way off course. Hey, any of us could be. This is the great thing. It. This is the great thing about betting on, on Cheltenham. Nobody yeah. has a bloody clue what's going to happen. Trainers, jockeys, Absolutely. owners, tipsters. Fans, that's what makes it so enthralling. Nobody really knows how these horses are going to perform until the races are underway. That's why bookmakers drive Rolls Royces. But if I'm right about Tihupu, maybe I'll be <laughs> getting an Uber in a Rolls Royce. Or it could just go go horribly, horribly wrong. Has, has Katie been removed by Robcor? Have they just like taken her out for daring oh, to... Sorry. Daring to, oh, it's okay. No, you're okay. Do do whatever. It's just, it's almost as if like Rob Rob Court didn't like you, your assessment. No, I was trying to connect. I was trying to connect to the Wi-Fi to see if it'd be better, but I don't think it would connect. We'll show yeah. you, Katie. You shut. Yeah, but no, I do love Tia Poo. I think he's a brilliant horse. I just doubt him at Cheltenham. So okay. Uh, final selection for the stairs hurdle, Katie. Um, I think as much as I love Tia Poo, I just worry about him, and I think I'm gonna go. With a long shot again, I think I'm just going to stick with, see what side of Burley could do, and I think he holds the value. I'm keeping the faith with Tihupu. We'll show Katie Young on the review show. And um, Sir Gerard. I think Sir Gerard's a fascinating runner, but... The Trusted Trader played handicapped Jays. Craig Billy has been a huge talking horse. He's now 7-2 to two for the plate. Theatre Man comes to this race instead of the Ultima. 5-1 to one shot, Paul Jacobs. Crack the puzzle that is the plate. Well... Well, the value's gone from Cravilli, and I don't think he jumps well enough in any case. I think he's got a lot to learn about jumping. His shape over a fence, for me, isn't brilliant, but he may well have improved. He's obviously uh, going to be intensively schooled since last time and the time before, but I'm worried. Theatre Man is obviously hugely interesting on his run behind Ginny's here, um, but the price has gone with him as again, again, and I think he could be one of the gambles against the two Irish horses here. Uh, he does stay further. The problem with him is he's going to be outpaced at some stage during this race. Can he keep himself in the race with a chance to play, turning for home? Outside a hereditary rule I thought was quite interesting, he had two blowouts over hurdles. 
He's only two pound hard and went sixteenth last year. But if we watch the race again, he held every chance two out. His chance lies with the ground drying out, though, and that's a big imponderable and probably a no-no. Casey Young, who wins the plate? A horse that I've been kind of following this season, and I actually really liked him in Gordon's as well, was St. Felician. I think he's had a few nice runs um, this season. He's plenty of experience now. Like he's, He looks much simpler to train this season. Like If you look back to his form, like he, he's one or two runs a season, whereas this season now he's had four runs back-to-back -back and fin not out of the first three. I think he might be coming under this, under the radar a little bit. I think he's much better than he's probably we've seen of him. And his runs have actually, he's been behind some really good horses. Tactical move um, since gone on and won at Nace at the weekend, impressively. Um, he was only three lengths behind him. Um, he's also, I think he was behind Fasal Vega early on in the season, his first start, where he had to make the run and looked very awkward at times. Um, he's been behind Indiana Dream, who looked an absolute superstar. Um, unfortunately, he was out the season since. But like, I, I don't think he can knock his form. Um, he's coming into this with plenty of experience. Looks much easier to train this season. And I think he holds a little bit of value at 14 to 1. He's a nice weight, um, about 146, 11, 7. Um, I just think he could turn up here. I know he disappointed at Cheltenham in 2022 in the in the Coral Cup and he ran no sort of race where he was sent off favourite for that but I just think he looks a little bit more straightforward this season and I'd be keen on him. I thought in Excelsis Deo was intriguing. Johnny Burke has been booked for Harry Fry on seat of the last day sent off favourite was behind Madara that form has worked out very well from Cheltenham uh, behind Dancing on My Own is going to go for the uh, Grand Annual. That was over two miles. Stepping up on trip might suit him. He's a 25 to one shot. Don't think he's necessarily a JP plot horse. Just think he's he's an intriguing one who could go well at a bit of a price. Um, I think this is a bit of a nightmare of a race. So I'm going to defer to Paul and Katie, but he's an intriguing one. By the time we're talking about him on TalkSport, I might very well have a, have a different opinion. Uh, to the Mayor's Hurdle, this is arguably one of the novice races of the entire week. Brighter Days Ahead has been punted off the boards into the 11 to 8 favorite uh probably because there's so much confidence coming out of Colin Trow about her but there's massive confidence coming out of Cliss Sutton about Jade de Grugy and huge confidence from Fergal O'Brien about Dysodinus something has got to give but which of the three will come out on top Katie Young can't look past bright days ahead um I know um everyone in Colin Trow is mad about her um, I don't think, to me anyway, I know a few people uh, question her running over two mile five and dropping back two mile. I don't think that's necessarily a problem with her. I think it was just Gordon wants to run her in a race and that was the only suitable race within the time frame that he had with her. Um, so I wouldn't be worried about that at all. Um, like she's related to uh, Mike Potter and Colwell Potter, who are both grade one winners over a two mile in their novice campaign. So, like she'll have no problem over two mile this year with a view then to step up to two and a half, three mile maybe in the future. But she, I think she's plenty of pace to be very competitive at, uh, over two mile. I don't think, I don't think you should be questioning that at all. Um, the track will suit her a bit of juice in the ground will surely suit her as well now. Um, and I think the new course suit her down to the ground too. I just can't look past her to be honest. I think she's just, the real deal um the fact that Shane McCann has, speaks really high volumes of this mayor like he'd be one of the best judges in Cullen Trial now like he's been there probably 10 15 years at least maybe more um but he he rode all the good horses Don Cossack Sam Crow like and if he said a horse is a good horse they're a good horse so I just I'm very sweet on her um I think I don't know whether there's, there is much between her and Jade Grugy. We haven't enough to, to suggest that, but Jade Grugy's form probably isn't working out quite as well. I don't think that, that anything behind her has done much since. Um, Dice or Enos, I think the ground may be a little bit um, like we 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 talked about at the show that maybe it might not be quick enough for her um, and. 
yeah, I just don't know whether she has the class that the other two mares have, but very, very keen on bright days ahead. Paul Jacobs. Yeah, I mean, we were saying before the show, as Katie um, intimated there, that uh, ground is going to play a huge part, and I agree with you, Emma. I think this is this is a cracker of a renewal, isn't it? I really love it. This three-way go, and I think Brayter Days Ahead has by far the best form of the two Irish mares, of course. No £5 penalty for Dyes at Enos, but even when I build that into my, my private ratings, which I do on every race, I still have a £6 short of Brighter Days Ahead. So, um, two things have got to go the way of Dyes at Enos. One, the ground's got to dry out. I don't want it to be softer than good to soft. And two, she wouldn't want an end-to-end -end gallop because between the three of them, I I think that, and if you have a look at the sectionals at the end of their races, um, Dyes at Enos has by far the superior turn of foot. And I can see here, brighter days ahead, um, trying to run the finish out of Dyes at Enos and Jade de Grugy. Because we know she stays well, and why not? What a perfect venue to do that on the new course, where stamina is a prerequisite. So I'll be surprised if Jack doesn't really use that stamina to the full. Instead of sitting and sitting, sitting on her, as he has done this season, because she's been far superior to the other merge she's, she's beaten in any case. She was always going to win whatever way she's ridden. I think he's going to make this a test of stamina. Draw the finish out of Enos. I think her form is far superior than Jay Grigio. Jay Grigio looks a lovely athlete. I think she's wonderful over a hurdle. She's very quick, isn't she? From one side to the other, she's really efficient. But I think the way the race is run and the possibility of the ground being the way it possibly is going to be, I have to agree with Katie. I, th I think Brighter Days Ahead um, is one of the, the better odds against favourites in the whole meeting. Oh. On official ratings, Dice Adinas has got no chance here. Handicapper in the yeah. BHA gives and her one. And five pounds as well. Yeah, he gives yeah. her one three one, but Brighter Days Ahead is one one four three. Jade de Grugy one four one. So five pound swing wouldn't be enough. Yep. Um, on RPRs, oh. Jade de Grugy comes out on top one fifty. Brighter Days Ahead one four nine. Dice Adinas one four two. On time form, Brighter Days Ahead is one five three p. Dice Arenas is 152P. Jade de Grugy is 149, but with a capital P. So it is a three horse race. It's really a two horse race. And in that circumstance, it's in a coin flip. If you can get the bigger price, you take the bigger price. So I'm going with Jade de Grugy. The, the hype about her from the Mullins camp is massive. She's beaten the Geldings on her first start of the season. I think Katie's right. That form's not working out very well, but she was visually very impressive. And she was a very strong favorite for that race as well. And she's gone to the Sol Arena where she's dropped down in distance and absolutely murdered her rivals. Again, the form doesn't really amount to a whole lot. A penny hundred got beaten the other day, but she couldn't have done it any easier. Willie Mullins has won this race on countless occasions. I think he'll win it again, but massive respect for Gordon's horse, Brighter Days Ahead. It's a price differential. If Brighter Days Ahead was the bigger price, I'd be agreeing with both of you and saying she's the one. But given the fact that you're getting nine to four as we're recording about Jade DeGrugy, that's where we'll be going. Will I still be on the Jade DeGrugy bandwagon come Thursday? Yes. Yes, I will on TalkSport 2, and you can listen to every single race live on TalkSport 2 this week. The Kim Yor 5.30 final race on the Thursday. Uh, the betting is headed. But this could be the race Cool Survivor goes for as well, uh, but I know the way you're thinking. Massively talked up on the show by Gavin Lynch a few days ago. Four to one is the best price you can get about him. Is he going to be that short a price on the day, though, Paul Jacobs? Oh, uh, no, I've absolutely no idea. Uh, this race normally run at a devil's pace, as you know. Uh, that's going to be the case again. Um, and as I reckon, I've had a look at the likely runners here, Emmett and Katie. And I've, I've got five that possibly like to lead and no less than nine presses. And it's an amateur rider's handicap chase. So they're going to go like a bat out of hell, as they normally do. I think that'll play into the hands of a holder, of course, if any of the amateur jockeys have the balls, you know, to just hold on, hold on, hold on. Flash to Tuzane um, is a player here, but I think he's being aimed at the Scottish National again. Um, all the money has been on Bow to Greatness, who for me has improved over a trip like this, ain't guaranteed to stay. And the other way you're thinking has obviously been laid out for this, and even off top weight, 145 could be well with him in his domain. But I worry about his jumping as well in a fast run race. 
one from seven over fences, never near a six of 27 in the paddy power, was an eye-catching. It nearly tore my retina out. Best served by being held up in a fast run race. Popped around in rear before making stealthy headway on the final circuit. Previously a front runner. Now they found out how to ride him. 142 looks a very viable mark for Amright. Discuss. I would agree. I would absolutely agree. Amright was the horse I was interested in. I was nearly interested in him for the Ultima when he was still in that. Um, does he go? You have to bring that up again. Ah. Pain, too much pain. Do you have any? Do you have any doubt about him going left-handed? Possibly, yeah. Possibly, but not, but not totally, not comprehensively, not, not, not proven. I don't think no. Yeah, that was the only thing that worried me with him. But I think he's very, very interesting. What is he? Ten to one still? Yeah, yeah. Katie Young, the lucky last, who comes out on top? I know the way you're thinking. I think he's. Solid, four to one, very good price for him. I don't think he'll be that. Um, between now and and Thursday, I think he's yeah. I think he is the probably one of the best bets for the week. Um, yeah, just can't really f look past him to be honest. Um, four very good runs this season. Um, handicap company, no problem stepping up to three mile. That's going to bring out. That's the key to him now, bringing out that little bit more improvement. And I'd say he's, yeah, very very exciting for this race. So that is my bet for that for this race. And for a little bit of value, I'm quite keen on where it all began. I think I'm not sure if this is the plan, but and I don't think he'll get. I think he'll struggle to get international. So I'd say the connections were likely likely to come here. But I thought he was very. He did a very taken performance at Punchtown on his latest start. I thought he was very, very impressive. Um, I think he's only just kind of getting the hang of things. This horse, he was, he's, he was. I was there when he was in Gordon's, and he was a bit frustrating. Like he, he's plenty of ability, but just probably wasn't putting it onto the track. And this season, he looks. He really looks like he's getting putting everything together, and he looks like he's coming out on top. I think sixteen to one is good value for him. Uh, I don't know whether he'd be good enough to beat. I know the way you're thinking, but from value point, I think he's very interesting. Is Angel's Dawn just being completely underestimated this year? It's a better race this year, I think. Mm. Mm, probably. probably. With more unexposed horses. Uh, fascinated to see who Venetia Williams runs. Very interested in, I know the way you're thinking. Obviously, Katie has just made a massive case for him. Um, and if you look at his form, I mean, he was sent off 11-2 to two for that handicap at the Dublin Racing Festival, where things didn't quite pan out for him. Prior to that, he's behind, imagine, a big money purchase now for Harry Durham and Gaelic Warrior. And that um, pedigree, she's producing some horses as well, like um, yeah. that dam. Yeah. They have another four-year-old maiden this year that looks really impressive on debut. Like, proper three-mile chases, so... I just, yeah, I can't really see past him at the moment. Um, yeah, very keen on him. Okay. Who is your nap of day three, Paul Jacobs? Um, each way, Colonel Harry in the opener. Katie Young. Probably have to say brighter days ahead. Price, if you're looking for a bit more value, probably I know the way you're thinking. Tia Poo, Fasal Vega, <laughs> Envoy Allen. Jay DeGruji, and throw in, I know the way you're thinking as well. There's the lucky 31. Don't complicate your mind. Keep it simple. This could all end absolutely horribly. That's the, the multiple that I'm going to do on day three. I'm going to do it now. I'm going to do that multiple right now because the last thing I want to do is put horses up and then not back them. That's not what we do in the Final Furlong Podcast. Paul backs his horses. Katie is at the racing every single day. I'm not, not expecting her to be back in, but I suspect you've already backed. I know the way you're thinking by the way you're talking. Put him into a double with something now, I'd say. There's actually a, a horse that I actually forgot about and I've been keeping an eye on was White White, Ron, right, White Rhino in the Per Temps for Ollie Greeno and Josh Guerrero. Um, I think he's an intriguing runner. Ollie's horses are flying at the minute and 
probably underestimated a little bit as well. So I definitely be keeping an eye on him. He's Cheltenham form over three mile. Um, new course as well. I think at his price fourteen to one for the per attempts would be a big shout as well. Only one firm still going fourteen to one. Katie's opened the checkbook. Uh, Ten to one. White Rhino has been cut to by most firms, yeah. but you can still get a little bit of that. Um, if I've already put up one John Joe Neal handicapper, I should be mentioning Springwell Bay in case I didn't mention him earlier on. I think he's got a huge chance in that race. Um, of course, Monbeck Genius will have already won the Ultima, so John Joe will be <laughs> chasing down his double. Um, all right, Paul Jacobs, Katie Young, thank you so, so much for joining us. Fascinating insight from both of you. Really enjoyed recording this show with you. Enjoy Cheltenham, and please, God, we'll talk to you again very, very soon. God bless. And thank you for listening and watching the Final Furlong Podcast. If you like this episode, a like and subscribe on the YouTube channel is hugely appreciated. It's all we're asking for you, from you, of you, even if I could use my mouth words correctly. Why do they always fail towards the end of the show? If you're stuck out and about, don't worry. We've got you covered for Cheltenham. Uh, all four days covered for you on TalkSport and TalkSport 2. You can tune in to Lee McKenzie, Tony McCormick, Rupert Bell, Lizzie Kelly, and myself for all four days from Paul Jacobs, Katie Young, and me. We'll talk to you again very, very soon on the Final Forum Podcast. Look after yourself and each other. God bless.